So let's pray as we get into the Word of God tonight. How many of you have your Bibles with you? If you have your Bible with you, then just, why don't you just lift it up? Let me see it. I want you to, I want you to shake it a little bit. Just make sure there are no spider webs in there. Okay, that's good. So tonight I want to talk to you about something a little bit different. And it's something that goes through our fiber and everything that we believe. And so this evening I want to talk to you about the power of words. The power of words. The universe came alive with a word. Jesus healed the sick and he cast out demons with a word. Societies have risen and fallen based upon all of their words. Christians have worshipped through words of song, through words of confession and preaching. Whether it be politics or education, business and relationships, every single one of them centers on words. So what does the master have to say about words? What is it about words that you and I need to realize? Because if in fact that it is true that all of the earth and all of creation was flung into its place by that which was spoken, what in the world do words mean to you and I? In James chapter 3, let's begin with verse number 1. I want to read it to you from the Message Bible. James chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, don't be in any rush to become a teacher, my friends. Teaching is highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards. It says, we all make many mistakes, but those who control their tongues can also control themselves in every other way. We can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a tiny rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. So also, the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It's full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's an uncontrollable evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. It's just not right. And so what I want to do is I want to go through most of the words, or most of the, let's just say, the verses in the book of Proverbs when it comes to the area of words, but I could not start without giving you a verse from the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 19, verse number 14, the Bible says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In usual fashion, there are many individuals that what they do is that they believe that the teaching about words has something to do with others and very little to do with themselves. It's almost as though that they walk free from the regulations that actually house the very things which cause us to win or to lose in life. So all of the rest of these verses will be from the book of Proverbs until I once again get to my final statement. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 2, he said that you are snared with the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. He said there, he said that you actually are tripped up, not by what someone else says, but by what you say concerning what someone else says. He said then you are actually taken as a prisoner to words. Because you're snared by the words 
of your mouth. Tonight, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, the thoughts that are going on inside of your mind are nothing more than the words that you've been spending your weekend with. Many of us, what we do is that we do have affairs. And these affairs that we have are with words. Those words which we know are not right, those words that we know will not build, those words which we know will not help, but yet we spend the time with those words. Those words cause us to win, to lose, to live, to die, to feel good about someone or to feel horrible about them. And so he said, you are snared with the words of your mouth. He said, you're taken with the words of your mouth. Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 19, the Bible tells us, in the multitude of words, sin is not absent. In the multitude of words, there is no lack of sin. He said, but he that refrains his lips is wise. So I guess it's probably better that if you can't say what God said about something, it's better for you to say little to nothing at all. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 12. In the New King James, he said, He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. The Message Bible tells us, Mean-spirited slander is heartless. It's heartless. But quiet discretion accompanies good sense. Remember, we've talked many times in the past, some things I think some of you liked it, others of you wondered why in the world would I ever approach that subject. But remember, discre discretion is the queen of all virtue. So he said their mean-spirited slander is heartless. But quiet discretion accompanies Good sense. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 18, it says, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Another translation says this, There are those whose uncontrolled talk are like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise makes one well again. It makes a person well again. In verse 19, it says, the truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. One of the things that you need to understand about this very issue is this, is that when a person is lying, that is just for a moment to them. But when a person is lying, it's something that lives with you forever. A person can repent over something that they said. But for another individual to have it no longer bother them is almost impossible in nature. Because you're always wondering, is there any truth to that? I wonder if there's anything that, some, that you know. Yeah, there's always a little bit of truth in everything that someone says. So let's take a look and see what Solomon wrote concerning this. He said, the truthful lips shall be established forever. A person who tells you the truth, you don't really talk about individuals that tell you the truth, but the thing that you remember is when someone lies. And so he said, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. He just drops that seed and then walks away. Do you understand that? So he, Proverbs 12, 25, it says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Another translation says, depression in the heart of man causes it to stoop, but a good word will make him glad. Then, in Proverbs chapter four or 13, verse number 3, the Bible says, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. He said, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Everyone say words. words. Say words are, words are powerful. Boy, they are, they are just so powerful. One of the things that you heard me say when I first began to speak was about how that people actually praise God in song. 
they actually have words that they begin to sing to the Lord. But yet at the same time, those can also be the things that, those same words which take you to the highest heavens, words can also take you to the depths of hell. So that's the reason why the confession of God's word is so important to the life of those who say they believe. And so here he said once again, he who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips, he said that he shall have destruction. Chapter 14, verse number 1, says that the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Isn't it interesting? Is that, once again, I want to say, the wise woman builds her house. So with a, with a woman's words, a woman can build everything that is around her with what she says. But the foolish woman, she actually will rip down whatever she's even got. If she doesn't even have very much, she will use her words to destroy rather than to heal. And from there, after Proverbs 14, verse number 1, Proverbs 15, verse number 1 says this, A soft answer turns away wrath. Let me encourage you, it seems as though that many high-level leaders around the world have picked up this thought. And that is that you must discipline your environment to respond to a soft voice. Not to a loud one, but to a soft one. When a person will not respond to a soft voice, they have told you everything you need to know about them. Because God's word is soft. His voice inside you is still and small. Isn't that true? One of, let me just mention this here since it's on my mind. One of the reasons why that I am not necessarily a proponent of face-to-face -face confrontation. I used to think that it was fearful. That I didn't want to confront anyone face-to-face -face because I was afraid to do so. I already realize that, you know, that the reason why that we do not ask people questions is because we don't think that the answer we might get would be the one that we wanted, so we don't ask the questions. Understood? Okay. But the reason why that I do not, I personally, other people have different feelings about it, but I prefer to take a biblical perspective on my, on my walk with God. There has never been a time in my life when the Lord ever spoke with me where he was screaming at me. There's also never been a time when the Lord ever spoke with me that he sat down in front of me and he said, I want to talk to you about something. Even in the book of Revelation, when Jesus was speaking to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, not one time did he appear to anyone. Do you understand that? That's the reason why that I prefer not to confront in person because when you see a person that's in front of you, what did the Apostle Paul say? The Apostle Paul said these words concerning confrontation. He said that you speak like this, that my words are heavy and my letters are strong. He said, but don't think that my, my meekness is weakness. Because I can be in front of you the same as I was by letter. I don't have a problem in doing so. And so my, per, my preferences are to allow an individual to, to have the Holy Spirit deal with them. Because, remember this, any person who is convinced against their will, remember, is of what? The same what? Anyone convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. Just because you can win an argument does not mean that you won your brother. 
Just because you can win an argument at home doesn't mean you've won the person. If Linda will not respond to a small voice, she's not going to respond to someone yelling at her. We don't yell. Ever. Ever. So I want you to understand, that's the reason why that I choose what I've chosen. Because before destruction, before destruction, remember this, biblically, before destruction, the last voice that you will ever hear will be human. Do you understand that? That's the last voice. You need to give people the right to be able to hear from God, but the last voice that you'll ever give them will be a human voice, and that human voice is the last warning that they get before it's over for them. So I decide, I, I choose to take a step back to see what a person believes. I don't want to believe what a person tells me. I only want to believe what a person does. Now, isn't that true? I mean, you may feel a, a little bit different about that, but I don't. Because I have to be at this place all the time. And so it's kind of like, well, don't you think that you should sit down with so-and-so? No, I really don't, because I don't want to control my environment. If you cannot be trusted to listen to God's word, you are certainly not going to listen to mine. Because the responsibility of life on the responsibility of being a husband is not upon Linda's nagging me. It's upon my responsibility as being a man before God. The responsibility of her being a wife is not upon me, nor in my ability to be able to manipulate her into becoming what I want her to be. Let us tell the truth about the issue. I cannot make you obedient to God. There's no way in the world. Now, I can actually get you walking on water so that when you fail, all you'll do is blame everybody else for what happened. So I can get you walking on water. My point is, is that the best way to do it, if you're going to fail, do it quick. Because then there'll be less consequences that are involved. The longer you wait to fail, when that's what you've chosen to do. Now, if you've chosen not to fail, that's where I live. You want to win? I'm there for you. But if you want to lose, just try to make as small of a splash as you possibly can. Because you don't really realize consequences are lifelong. They're not for 20 minutes. You understand that? Consequences are lifelong consequences. Okay. So that's the reason why that I feel like I feel about it. Once again, Proverbs 15.1, it says that a soft answer turns away wrath. I know some of you don't agree with me. Stop talking to me. I know you don't agree. But that's okay. You can do it the way you want to, but you'll figure it out after a little while. I've done this for a long time, as long as some of you have been alive and then some. So I get it. I have a lot of experience concerning this. If experience, if knowledge guided by experience means anything, then I can tell you confrontation does not work. It only makes you feel good. But until a person has a heart change, there is no change no matter what. Until they change. Because it has nothing to do with you. You're not the one who has to change. They're the one that has to change. Well, I've just got to confront my kids. For, what are you going to confront them for? It's like you think that they don't know that you know? No, you don't need to confront them. What you need to do is you need to make a decision if you can live with it. You don't need to confront them. You have to decide if this is going to live in your crib. Well, I caught them. That's the worst thing to ever do is catch somebody. Because now... The responsibility isn't on them. They're looking at you saying, well, okay, now what are you going to do? Now, is that true or not true? All right, all right, all right. That's all I'm saying. So then, uh, let's go on to the next verse. 
The next verse should be verse number two. He says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools will pour forth foolishness. Now that's interesting. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. Everyone say discretion. Discretion, discretion is a huge part of life. It truthfully is. And so verse four, he said, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Remember, what did God attempt to keep Adam from? The tree of what? Okay, he didn't want him eating of the tree of life. Because if he would have ate, eaten of the tree of life, he would have lived forever or forever. So a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Adam used his words that got him into the situation that he's in. Don't think it was an apple. It was words. And when people don't understand that Adam's sin was a sin of words, those sins of words were the very thing that actually have put you and I exactly where we are. Nations rise, nations fall on words. People love, people hate based upon words. People are good at doing what they do or they're horrible at what they're doing based upon the words that they speak. Adam used his words to actually take a place with God that God did not give to him. Say, I will never, I will never attempt to take authority, to take authority over, anything over anything that God has not made me responsible for. People ask me, so what do you think of this? I said, I don't. They said, what do you mean you don't? I said, I don't. I said, well, you don't have any opinion about that? No, I don't. Well, why don't you have an opinion about that? Because I don't take authority over what I'm not responsible for. People have asked me almost every day, what do I think about Creflo Dollar's $65 million jet? What do I think? Every, every silly day. People, what do I think about it? Don't you think that he could get a jet for less money? I, I said, you know what? I don't, I don't know. I understand a 737 costs $27 million. And this jet is $65 million. So he must, for some reason, believe that that's what he needs. And for whatever reason, that's not my deal to talk about whether I think that it's right or wrong for him to do whatever he wants to do. Well, do you think it's right? Don't ask me if I think it's right. I will not take authority over what I'm not responsible for. You know, we, in the age of social media, in the age, now remember, previous to 1987, 88, 89, all you had were three channels, newspapers and magazines and radio. That's all you ever had. In 1998, when the internet was given birth and AOL came to life, from that moment until this moment, there you cannot get two people to agree about anything. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I don't really like what so-and-so did. You know what? I'll tell you what. When you take pictures, you ask people to take your good side, don't you? When people show stuff on the internet, they show everybody's ugly. They showed you without makeup. I started looking at some celebrities without makeup. I said, hey, no celebrity. That's my cousin Judy. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not a celebrity. That's my Aunt Judy. I never told you about my Aunt Judy, did I? Did I ever tell you about Aunt Judy? Oh, man, she was something. She was beautiful. Aunt Judy was wonderful. Aunt Judy was, she made truck drivers afraid. <laughs> My Aunt Judy can make truck drivers afraid, like the worst kind of truck driver, that, that Aunt Judy. But then what she did was she actually went to work when it used to be Illinois Bell Telephone. How many of you remember that? That was before AT&T, it, it was... You know, Ma Bell was what they called it. And if you ever had a job at Ma Bell, you really had a great job. That was a great job if you had a job at Ma Bell. I tried to get one. 
actually uh, during uh, right after the Vietnam War. I tried to get a job at Ma Bell. I didn't, uh, I didn't make the grade. Let's just put it like that. But I wanted that job. But what happened was, was that my Aunt Judy got a job working for Illinois Bell Telephone. And she got a job as an operator. <laughs> now, if you ever talk to Aunt Judy on the phone, Aunt Judy, she sounded kind of like somebody that you wanted to get off the phone with. She didn't sound like she was somebody that really you wanted to do it. But she went, she had to be, go through training. She went through training, Aunt Judy did. So in between, <coughs> <laughs> to when she went through training, I called my grandmother's house. GR81176 was her number. Grove Field 8, 2176. That was my granny's phone number. She lived at 5326 South uh, Artesian in Chicago, right by Western. And she, um, so Aunt Judy, she picked up the phone after she went through training, and she said, hello. <laughs> I was like, like freaking out when Aunt Judy answered the phone. How can I help you? I'm thinking, is this Granny's house? <laughs> oh, yes. Robbie, is that you? <laughs> I said, yes, who's this? <laughs> she said, this is your Aunt Judy. I was going, <laughs> that's my Aunt Judy. So, A soft answer. <laughs> turns away, see, you didn't think I could go back to the Bible. <laughs> A soft answer turns away wrath. You could get in an argument with Aunt Judy up until she started working for Ma Bell, and you could never argue with her ever again because she was just so soft-spoken. She was just so sweet. Verse 4, where it says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks a person. Wrong words will break you. It puts holes inside your heart. Wrong words. And then, Proverbs chapter 6 to 15, verse number 23. It says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth. So if you're a person that's lacking joy in your life, all you need to do is change what you're saying. Because a man has joy by the answers of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. I called another country yesterday. And the man said to me, so grateful that you called. I picked up Linda last night at the airport on her way back from seeing the kids. And the phone rang. Now, I would not have normally picked it up, especially when I just saw her for the first time in a month. But it was this guy. And he said to me, he said, you have no idea what the words that you spoke to me actually did. I'd lived in this turmoil and this confusion. I didn't know what was going to happen, but what you said to me actually became the very thing which caused me to be victorious in the situation that we were in. And I want you to know everything is fine. Because a word that is spoken in due season, how good it is. See, the Lord will use you to be able to call someone. Whenever you have someone that you're thinking about, if you say, I'm thinking about this person, you're not thinking about that person. God is thinking about that person inside you. When he gives you someone inside your mind or inside your heart or you've just been thinking about someone, he didn't do that so that you could say, I had these pleasant thoughts about them. He did it so that you would call them. 
You can tell them, I don't know why I called. I've just called. I, I just called to tell you how great of a person I think you are. And then on the other end of the phone, a person just begins to cry. You don't know what I just faced. You don't know where I've been. You don't have to know. All you need to do is respond when that person is in your heart. I don't want to say when the Holy Spirit brings you something because then all of a sudden you'll start thinking it's different than you. But when you think about someone, call them. Don't allow any kind of embarrassment or intimidation keep you from picking up a phone because you don't know what a person needs. Isn't that true? Yes. Okay. Then Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 23, the Bible says this, The heart of the wise teaches his mouth. You actually know much more than you know. Listen to yourself, you'll learn something. It says, the heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Verse 24, pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Proverbs chapter 17, verse number 9, the Bible says this, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates the best of friends. Say, I cover transgressions and I seek love. I don't repeat matters which separates the best of friends. There will come a time when you need to talk about something. But most often, you don't need to talk about stuff. Only if you have to save somebody else's life, that's when you repeat it. You don't repeat it for you, you repeat it for them. For you, you're covering it. But for them, you're giving them knowledge so that they can make a right decision. So that he that covers a transgression seeks love, but he that repeats a matter will separate the best of friends. Verse number 27 and 28 out of the Message Bible, it says, The one who knows much says little. An understanding person remains calm. Even dunces who keep quiet are thought to be wise. As long as they keep their mouth shut, they're smart. So if you think you're a dunce, or if other people think you're a dunce, how's that? Then just be quiet, because you actually can seem smarter than you really are. In chapter 18, verse number 8, the Message Bible says this, listening to gossip is like eating cheap candy. He said, do you want that junk? You want, do you really want junk like that down in your belly? Listening to gossip. Remember that. Gossip isn't necessarily completely wrong information. It becomes gossip for the reason why you're saying what you're saying. That's why it becomes gossip. Because why are you saying that? Why are you talking about that? What benefit did you bring to anyone? Did what you say bring grace to the hearers? Or did what you say actually minimize the value of someone in the eyes of someone else? So he said this, listening to gossip is like eating cheap candy. He said, do you really want junk like that down in your belly? Verse number 13, he that answers a matter before he hears it, it's folly. Or let's just say that it's stupid for you to answer something before you even know the facts. It's important for you to know the facts about something if you have to answer that matter. You have to know what the facts are. And remember, verse 17 there, which I did not use, that the first one that comes to plead his cause seems to be right until someone comes forth 
and begins to ask questions. What happens is people who gossip usually don't talk to the person who really has the answers. They're only talking to the people that are gossiping. They're not talking to the people that are being gossiped about. Never do that. Otherwise, Aretha Franklin's going to come to your house singing shame, shame, shame. I think that's that song. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 20, out of the Message Bible, it says, Words satisfy the mind as much as fruit does the stomach. Good talk is as gratifying as a good harvest. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Words kill or words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You're the one who chooses. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 23. It says, watch your words and hold your tongue. You'll save yourself a lot of grief. Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 11. The Bible says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Another translation says it just makes beautiful jewelry. Words fitly spoken. What words... Are you doing? Are you using? Now, let me explain something to you because I understand that people know the opposite of this, but they don't know what I'm about to say. Is that in this room, you have one unit. Just like one body has many parts. You have fingers, hands, toes, brain, lungs, heart, kidneys, hips, and lips. You have them all. You got everything there. And all of the people in this room all play a particular part. The moment that one person begins to act out of the position that God gave them inside, the bo inside of his body, the body begins to eat itself and it goes to attempt to recreate what a person now is doing. So you just have to know that everybody in one room is one person. And you either add value to the person that you're in the room with or you detract value from that person. But you do one or the other. Your words either build or kill other people all the time. And then, Proverbs chapter 27, verse number 2, some of us probably need to hear this. Let another praise you and not your own mouth. Someone else. And not your own lips. Verse number 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 20 in the Message Bible, the Bible tells us this. He said, observe the people who always talk before they think. Can you imagine that? He said, observe the people who always talk before they think. Even simpletons are better off than they are. Observe the people who always talk before they think. They go, oops. I just wasn't thinking. I wasn't, I know, I can see that. You do that a lot. Uh, I get it. So the sum of it all is this to me. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 20 through 22, I want to finish with this. There's not one totally good person on earth. Not one who is truly pure and sinless. Don't eavesdrop on the conversation of others. What if the gossip's about you and you'd rather not hear it? In verse 22, can we get verse 22 up there? 
He said, you've done that a few times, haven't you? Said things behind someone's back you wouldn't say to their face. Let's take a look at that once again. Give me verse 20 again. In verse 20, he says this. There's not one totally good person on earth, not one who is truly pure and sinless. Don't eavesdrop on the conversation of others. What if the gossip's about you and you'd rather not hear it? You've done that a few times, haven't you? Said things behind someone's back you wouldn't say to their face. That's the sum total of all of it for me. Words. Countries are built by them. Countries are destroyed by them. Friendships are built by them. Friendships are destroyed by them. Marriages are built by them. Marriages are destroyed by them. Words. There is no more powerful thing that you have in life. Gentlemen, your wife could never take you in a fight. But the smallest word of disapproval crushes you to nothing because words will bless or words will curse let's pray father thank you for tonight thank you thank you thank you if you know that your words have been stout and they've been wrong and you realize that they should not be what they are I would like for you to stand where you are let us pray. If you're standing, please pray after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am asking you to forgive me for words that I have spoken, but also words I have allowed to be spoken to me. In the name of Jesus, I am asking you for courage to speak correctly and to refuse incorrect speech in my presence. Thank you, Father, for the grace to act like you in every situation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.